This is a piece of birch bark. You may recognize it because birch is one of the very few trees with a white bark. Across the world, birch bark has been used to make canoes, paper, shelters, containers, even shoes. But how significant is birch bark to you? Does it hold any meaning for you? For us, birch bark only really began to mean something when we started using it every day. Every day, for a year, we would take a strip of bark from a fallen tree, scrape a knife along it to create a pile of shavings, and then create fire. Fire for warmth, fire to cook on, fire to share stories around. You could say birch bark helped us to reconnect with nature. You see, we needed to address a problem. Collectively, we have spent 20 years studying the mind-boggling array of diverse life forms on this planet, the stunning landscapes that they inhabit, and how human life intersects and interacts with all of this. And we've done this to be able to research, to communicate, to teach about the value of the natural world. We had done this to reach a point where we spent the majority of our waking hours inside, plugged in, sitting behind a laptop. Somewhere, something had gone wrong. The balance was completely out. So, we sought to redress it. I proposed to Gina that we should try to spend more time outside than inside. And as part of that, sleep outdoors too, in all four seasons of the year. <laughs> and I eagerly declined. <laughs> but then I thought more about it. I thought about all the things that I value in life. I thought about why I had started studying the natural world in the first place. The fact that I was in a luxurious position where I could choose to be outside more. I thought about the state of our planet. And I came to the realization that actually my own relationship with nature was pretty superficial. With that, we moved our lives outside. For a year, we tried to spend at least 50% of our time outside. We slept outside, ate, socialized, and worked, when possible, outside. The experiment that we refer to as a wild year gave the natural world a central place in our lives again, and equally gave us a place in the natural world. Our experiment brought a much needed sense of balance into our own lives. Sometimes I would walk home from work barefoot, feel the sand or pine needles or mud squidge between my toes. I would light my own fires using wet, birch bark, wash with snow, wonder if my knots would hold as my shelter bent in the wind. And I reassuringly answered a large number of questions from female friends on peeing outside. I felt liberated. But as comfortable as I was in the outdoors, there was always this niggling feeling of vulnerability when I was alone. For me, the outdoors has always been a joyful place. It gives me a sense of freedom and rejuvenation. At night, I take comfort in the call of a tawny owl. I've never really been concerned for my safety. Yet, spending so much time together outdoors made me realize that our shared adventures are very much experienced in different ways. You know, and that's not just about safety. Biologically, our bodies are different, and we respond to the elements in very distinct ways. For example, in the same environment, our cores stay at a similar temperature. Whereas my hands and feet can be up to three degrees colder, meaning that I feel the cold quicker than Kuhn. Over the course of the year, it began to make us question, how do others experience nature? How did our family, our friends, our colleagues experience nature? How did my students experience nature? Some mornings I would roll up my sleeping bag and walk straight from the woods into a windowless lecture theater to discuss with students how to conserve and govern the natural world. 
And there we were, talking about the importance of protecting nature that is out there, elsewhere, away from us. But these students know their stuff. I mean, they could probably tell you the Latin name of birch. Betula. The um, number of birch species are across the world? 46, approximately. The geographical range that it covers? The cooler temperate regions of the northern hemisphere right the way around the globe. Its global economic value? Yeah. <laughs> that one I'll have to get back to you on. Despite all this knowledge, birch or birch bark wouldn't really mean anything. What is happening in the classroom is symptomatic of what is happening on a larger scale. How in the space of 200 years has the majority of humankind become so disconnected? In the pursuit of progress, we have benefited, found comfort, extended our lives. But in doing so, we are losing touch with planet Earth. We're living beyond our means and destroying our home. It's a double whammy. First, all the beauty, intrinsic value, life support functions, ecosystem services, and millions of years of complex ecological webs of evolution are disappearing. Second, our own connection with nature seems irretrievably lost. It can be depressing, especially when you realize that biodiversity loss and disconnect from nature are intrinsically linked. The feeling is overwhelming. The feeling that you are part of a problem that is so big that whatever you do, it is not good enough. Was there anything that we could do other than preaching about the importance of protecting planet Earth? Our wild year gave us a glimpse of how we might be able to make a difference. We could rewild our teaching. On our first course, we simply took a small group of university students to the woods for three days. We invited them to engage with the environment. We looked for animal tracks, built a natural shelter. Nothing revolutionary about it. In fact, 99.99% of human evolutionary history was spent in close interaction with nature. So it's only a matter of reconnection, relocating what's inside us already. We had an idea that connecting with a local environment might cause a bit of a perception shift. But the connections that the students made went far beyond our expectations. They saw links to much deeper aspects of their learning. As one student put it, now I understand why I am studying. Now that's not bad for three days in the field compared to four years in a lecture theatre. Encouraged, we developed ideas further. Earlier this year, we put together a four-week course where students took on theory and practice in equal measure. Together, we practiced fire making in the woods. We interweaved that with theories on the cultural meaning of fire, and we considered the consequences of fire use in relation to environmental sustainability. We engaged with nature through our bodies, emphasized technique over technology, knowledge over projection, we got our hands and feet dirty. We slowed down. Not only did we see happier, more creative students with more thirst for insight, their learning curves were steeper and theoretical understandings deeper. Plus, they really started to love birch bark. Their connection with nature seemed to change. They reached an emotional, impassioned, more ecological perspective. Now, the value of nature-based relational learning is receiving increasing attention in academic literature. And for those who practice it, the approach is entirely logical. In the past 10 years, we've seen movements across Europe that promote play and engagement in outdoor environments. Nurseries are placing babies outside to sleep, and forest schools, where learning is encouraged in outdoor spaces, are on the rise. But what happens as children grow up? Do we suddenly lose the need to engage? 
Are we suddenly able to develop skills based on theoretical learning alone? This seems to be the consensus in most higher education courses. However, I don't know about you, but going to a dentist or a doctor who only read about treating patients, I'd be worried. In the context of today's global environmental crises, we need to rethink education. And the people that have convinced us most of that are our students. So we wanted to give some of our closing comments to them, those that have taken part in the courses we have run. This is what they had to say. I look differently at the world around me. I see what I want my life to look like in the future. I understand that I am part of a larger story. I feel very calm. I feel more alive. It is time for educational approaches at all levels to change. For students and teachers across the board, regardless of discipline, socioeconomic status, or age, to be stimulated to reconnect with nature. It is time for all of us to use our heads, hearts, and hands to engage with the natural world. So when you see a birch tree in a forest, in a park, or in the small square of earth sandwiched in the concrete outside your front door, reach out and let that tree light a fire within. <laughs>